Excellent. So, all right, good. It's good to see everyone. Good to see the familiar faces. We miss you all. God bless all of you. Okay, so going back to our point. So everything uh, with what Renee said was very, uh, very truthful and honest. And um, I, um, again, as I said earlier, my, my, my ministry has evolved as a clergyman. I know everyone else has as well, too. But this, this year has been surreal. But it's just been very, fr- just very, um, just very hurtful to see how everyone has been acting. And I feel like, I think it's a few things. As I said before, I think it's frustration. I think it's um, impatient, you know, not being patient. And then our third thing is, and I've said this recently to some people, and I, I'm going to bring this up to this body. And um, we are recording, so that's good. So if I get in trouble, I know I'll get in trouble. Why? Um, <laughs> I have a question that I really like to ask everyone here is, and I say this appropriately, that just because you're not coming to church or participating in the services, I'm not referring to this. What this has done for the last seven, eight months to me has shown me, in an essence, our true colors as Orthodox Christians. What am I, what am I, what am I actually saying by that? How many of us are actually faithful than participants of our Orthodox Christian faith? Now, when I say that, I'm not saying, again, not coming to church, not, I'm not including that, not pretend the sacraments, but really the question in our heart of what our Orthodox Christian faith is, and then in turn, how do we spread it to our world? And you're going to say, what are, you, what are you trying to insinuate, Father? What I'm trying to say here is that um, why – so, for instance – we're here learning about Bible study. I've had numerous conversations with people from March about the greatest question that has existed to man. Can anyone guess what question that is? Think since March. What has come up that everyone just all of a sudden starts asking about? What is our purpose? Mm, well, what's the meaning no? of life, right? Oh, let's okay. Just, let's watch, no, I'm just kidding. That we would watch, uh, you know, let's watch um, Monty Python or something to laugh about that. No, what, what? What, since March, now I'm talking about so during the pandemic, what do you think a priest has been asked the most now? Communion. Bingo. I have been asked so many times, how is communion given? And is everything okay with it? I tell them, uh, nothing's changed. It's the body and blood of Christ. So, and then they ask them, what is the question? Why do you want a question? Where is this coming from? And I want this not to embarrass people. I want to hear from the people's hearts and souls. I want to say, why are you asking this? What is the worry? Because as I stated it since we reopened in a May-June time, His Eminence and all the other hierarchs expressed this to us as well, too. They said, if you fear, that's okay. Because we all fear. I fear, too. But yesterday we celebrated Thomas. St. Thomas, the Apostle, the twin, Odidimos. And our Lord says, Miginis apistos al apistos. But not to be unfaithful or unbelieving, but to believe. And again, to me, to me, it's incredible when I hear that. Because remember, when they saw Thomas, they all exclaimed to him, we have seen the Lord. He's like, well, I don't care. Until I see him and touch his side and everything, I won't believe, Right. And then he sees them, and with tears of repentance, like Peter did, uh, the three times when Thomas saw and touched our Lord, he said, my Lord and my God. I ask people, so why do you question communion now when all the other years or all the other times you were just taking communion normally? I said, what is the question? I said, what is the fear? And it's not, again, to anyone's unfaithfulness or doubt. It's more so to ask because I'm trying to understand as a priest, and I know people have asked me, and I respect them for asking me, because that's good that they ask, because they are trying to learn and grow with their faith. So I ask about that, and I'm like, well, what, what's, what's the question here? Because, A, if, they're a, if they're, they have any fear, then it's okay, don't take communion. I mean, it's not to say that, you know, it's a can, and how dare you, and that's blasphemy. No, that's not right. Some of us have legitimate fears. And it's not so much the understanding that we're participating in the body and blood of Christ, but even just being in the presence or being at church can bring that fear upon people. And again, I'm saying this not to incite a, um, a debate. It's not a debate. It's just stating what has been going on. But then I've been seeing this 
lack of faith because now not in the not a communion, not a separate communion in general with our lives because it's now spread in the way we think. Going back to Renee, what Renee said, all of us have now all been living and we're all just going through life and it's like it's like we all have pistols. And what I'm saying, pistols, is that however someone says something, I'm gonna pull the trigger and say you're wrong, and I'm gonna sharp at them real quick. Or if it's someone I agree with and it's something radical, I'm gonna bite back. He's right, and I want everyone to know that. And I'm like what are you gaining by this? What am I gaining by this? What are they gaining by this? And I feel going back to the whole process of this, I just feel that we're losing our sense of humanity. And that's because I, what hurts me is I'm seeing this, especially from Orthodox Christians. And then you're getting people saying, well, this has nothing to do with my faith. This is what I, what I think and what I believe. When I say I believe, I start saying the creed. I believe in one God, the father almighty. That's my creed. That's my banner. And that's what I'm under. But I mean, does that not relate to what we're supposed to act as humans? And then what we're talking about tonight is scripture based, right? I mean, my gosh, everything our Lord teaches us tells us in 100% accuracy, the complete opposite of how we're supposed to act in this world, right? We're supposed to love. To those that hate us, you need to love them more. To those that want to hurt us, you need to pray for them and help them out more. To those that hunger, go give them food, not expecting anything in return. I thought that was powerful. You know, we, we give without receiving because even sinners give knowing that they're going to get something back from those that are fellow sinners. And that shows us what the whole purpose of that Sunday sermon was on Sunday was to say that not one single person of us should be deemed righteous. How about that one? <clears throat> I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. The people around us are not righteous. And you know what? That's great because we love them. We're there to support them. We're there to minister to them. And more importantly, we're there to pray for them because that's what our Lord calls us to do. So even if you're praying from home, you're praying at church. You take communion, you don't take communion. You are a Democrat, you're a Republican. You like this one, you like that one. I, I, again, I don't care. I care about you. I care about being there for you. And that's what we are called to do. So that's why I feel with this whole process and everything that we've been living it's just so, it's just so sad. It's so sharp to see what kind of world. And what I was relating early before is with the kids is what did we do with our parents? What did we do with our grandkids? And I look back again, I'm an anomaly. I'm a priest, but even I fall, you know, I'm a sinner. I mean, what I would like to hear, I know we got some elderly here as well too, that have children, even grandchildren. What have you guys felt or what do you see in the essence of what's going on here? Do you feel the world where it's at now. Now, again, I, I can't relate to what it might have been in the 50s and 60s, post-World War II, uh, at the time of the civil rights uh, movement and everything else. But I just don't understand what is everyone's attitude with everything going on here currently. So I'd like to hear from you again before we actually then now jump into our, uh, our Bible study for tonight. And again, I apologize for what I just said. I wasn't, I'm not single anyone out. It was the whole cornucopia of what we've been going through for the last nine to 10 months. So I'd like to hear from some of you, what you have felt and what you guys can understand as, uh, as parents, as, uh, as married people, as single people, you know, what have you felt and what have you seen about our world currently? In my lifetime, I have never seen a time where there is constant disrespect for authority being spoken all the time. Our police officers, our politicians talking about judicial nominations, what's being taught in school. I can't ever remember any time like this. What you watch on TV, it, it's total disrespect for any type of authority. It's, it's, all it's, right, but rebellion. It's very I mean, sharp. It's very sharp, yeah. I, I, I could sympathize, Deacon. What else? Anyone else? Uh, I could speak a little bit if, if I can. I'm probably the oldest one here. I don't know about that. <laughs> Actually, well, I'm 84 years old, so that's... <laughs> that's Go ahead. Close. Okay. Okay, uh, this is uh, deja vu for me. Because when I see everything, all the disruptions that are going on, the upheaval, the... The, the, the fire bombs and the, the, the looting and all that. 
It brings me back to my youth when I was uh, probably at that time nine years old, eight years old actually, and uh, yeah, nine years old. I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, there was uh, a, an eruption in Greece after mm. the Germans after the Germans left. There was a huge eruption in, in, in Greece between the the Democrats, if you will, and and the and the communists because yeah. the, the, the communists were coming in. Well. When the communists had their parade, everything went fine. Everything went, there, there was no problem. The following week, my mother happened to be down at the parade watching what's going on. My father and I had, had stayed home so we can cook the goose. And um, all, all of a sudden, all hell broke, uh, broke loose. They took over the, the police station and they put snipers out in the police station. And then they threw, if, if, you, if some of you have been to Greece, in front of the Rex Theater, down in Omonia, uh, they start throwing hand grenades into the people from the roofs. And my mother was wounded by that. Now you wow. talk about man's inhumanity to man. The fear that gripped my father, he had to, when, he, when, when her sister came back and said that my mother was dead, my father had to go from, from one, uh, you know, necrotomio, which is which is a, a a place where they place dead bodies, and open up the sheets and watch and see what 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 he finally found her. She was in a, in a gurney, uh, a, out in the hall of the of the hospital that I was born in. So you talk uh, the same thing that's happening now, except that we haven't gotten to throwing you know grenades and so forth. The same inhumanity to men that happened there happened here the hatred it was brother against brother. brother i have a question is it the communists doing that or the military doing that we're, we're here no in greece you. in greece no i no, didn't understand no it was it was the communists the, the they're communists. the they're the they are the the um violent ones they were the violent. that in, that's in, my question because i hear both sides no, and no, I, I understand what you're saying my dad told me the same thing Okay, he, he, he fled Greece from the communists. Yeah. Well, we and, fled in 1946. But anyway, this is, a, a, to me, it's deja vu. I, 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 I truly believe, Father, and you know, forgive me for saying this, we're living in apocalyptic times. I really, I, I really feel that. I think, it, I think the second coming will be coming, and it'll be coming, uh, according to my calculations, but only the Father knows. But it's got to come before the 6,000 year age uh, ends, which is 219 years from now. So mm. I think be prepared because all the things that you see, the volcanoes, the, everything is tremendous. The volcanoes, the fires, the, 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 the killing of animals, all these things where, where black is, is right and white is, is, is wrong. And, 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 the, and the Christians are, are, are bad and the Muslims are good. You know, black is white and white is black. I mean, it's it's all crazy. It's the same. It's the same synopsis that that, that has been occurred. If you if you well, anyway, I'm not going to get into that stuff right now. But but the but the thing is that I think we're nearing. If you read John and you go through John, if you if you have time to read it, and and you read not only John but you read the Book of Revelations, mm -hmm. read that sometime. Read that sometime. I I implore you to do that because. Uh, this is a course that I'm teaching this year down in, down in Florida. So I, I, this is my last year of teaching, by, by the way, down there. So I, I got to make it a good one. But anyway, <laughs> I, just want to, I just want you to know that I feel for everybody. We're all human beings. Doesn't make any difference if you're black or white, if you're green or yellow. It doesn't make any difference. We're hu the humanity, the humanitarian uh, understanding is out the window. It's all, it's all. Who can who can outdo the other? Mm. Greed, yeah. greed, power. And those those are demonic thoughts that are being put into in, infiltrating our children and infiltrating our colleges and so forth and going through. And what who fight up some people? I've eaten my loaf of bread. I mean, but so but I'm just telling you, when I see these things, it's not new to me. It's not new at all. I'm I'm up in my cabin up in northern Wisconsin and. I, I'm here with the birds, and I feed the I, I feed the deer every, every morning. So that we got some fat deer down down here. Right now. Is, is, is a, is so you're in your piece you're as well too. Absolutely, absolutely, that's absolutely. good. Anyway, um, I don't want to say anymore. I just, thank you, Peter. No, Adele, because we're going to continue to. Anyone else? Any last remarks on it? Just uh, 
just it's it's surreal and you know it's very difficult did anyone want to I say had that? a question about that six thousand thing it went over my head the two hundred thing and that six that i I didn't understand that That's Peter you could chime in it, it peter Peter's appropriate in the uh, calculations it's from the he'll tell you right now the the six thousand years it, it, as John said. One day is as a thousand years, and, 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 and a thousand years is as one day, if you, if you read about the, the understanding. What is the sixth day? It took, it, took, it took God, that we know, it took him six days to, 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 to build a world, okay, to build our world. And on the seventh day, he rested. So the six days is equivalent to 6,000 years. Now, if you look at the, if the, if you look at the Jewish uh, uh, calendar, we're in the year 5781, so we're nearing it. We're, we're nearing that, that, that's why I came up with a calculation of, 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 of 219 years. So something, it doesn't have to be there. It cannot, if it goes beyond that, then everything that we're talking about is all false. But, but the thing is that it, it, it will happen. It will happen sometime between now. Now, it doesn't mean that, that it can happen tomorrow. Only the God knows. You know, Iparusia, Iparusia, when, when he comes in, he'll come in as a, as a flash in the light, okay? Uh, maybe he'll come tomorrow. Maybe he'll come next, next week. I don't know when it's going to be. Only, only the Father knows. But all I can tell you, if all this 6,000, 6, and, and then I'm sorry, then the, the last 1,000 years will be a, an area where the, where the lamb will be able to sit with the lion without being devoured. That, those will be after the apocalyptic uh, time comes at, 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 at Armageddon. Then there will be a thousand years of peace. I'm never going to see it, <laughs> and neither one of us is going to see that. But, but supposedly, there will be peace on earth at some point. So, so Lenny, to your point, uh, just like Peter said, he is... He is appropriately uh, correct because it's coming from obviously the book of Revelations and naturally from what John has said as well too. So that's how we get to that determination of it. Again, some, some say others, some say yes. The whole point that I've always encouraged with the book of Revelations and we could, that's a, it's a very deep topic, but the most important <laughs> thing I tell people about that, it was simply a, a, I would call it as a forewarning. That's what I see it as. It's there to, it's there to tell us. We don't know when, Remember, he wrote that in 80, 85, 90 after Christ. They thought he was coming in a couple of years. They thought it was five years. They didn't know. So who knows? But the most important is the forewarning. And more for us is just to understand, to not to to understand it, to comprehend it. And then from there, to be humane. I mean, how else are we supposed to live? Like animals or worse? So that's where all this uh, information kind of stems and comes from. So um, I've done that one. Okay. Uh, let's kind of continue. We're going to get into uh, tonight's uh, reading. Um, I'm going to start screen sharing it. And it's, uh, let's go to chapter three in Luke. We're going to start chapter three. And we're going to hear now the, um, the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. So, okay. all right. So we see John the Baptist prepares the way. Um, all right. Who am I going to get to start to read first, if everyone could see? Um, all right. Matt. How about you start uh, ch uh, chapter three? Start with verse one. Sure. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etura and Trachonitis. Yeah. And Lys... Wow, why'd you Lys give me all the hard words? Lys Lysanias. <laughs> sure, tetrarch of El... El yeah, I'm not good at sounding things out. I'm going to take my kids. Oh, <laughs> I need to sound the same to State School. Yeah, I see. During the high priesthood of Aeneas and Caiaphas, the word yeah. of God came to John of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, mm. as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. Continue. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. Okay, pause. Thank you, Matt. So right here we're beginning, obviously, after the birth of Christ. Naturally, we already had talked about the eighth day. 
in which he received the name and his circumcision and the presentation into the, into the temple. Now we're seeing John being the one to prepare the way. Now John, St. John the Baptist, we know he's the Baptist, he's, a, he's the last prophet, and then he's the forerunner, o prodromos, the one who, get, who sets the way. And I think that's very important because this also, and you hear Luke, Luke is very historical. Look at him. He's going into the year, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Who was the governor? So they could see this is that. Who were the high priests? So the Jews understood who was this at this time. And then from there, I love this part. I mean, just look what he said. And then he went out into the wilderness into all the country around the Jordan, the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that's very powerful because now what baptism do we receive now? Is our baptism of water, or what are we baptized in? Who can answer that one? Holy Spirit and water, no? Uh, the water, yes. We oh. follow that just like Christ said, but, our, but ours is like what Christ, what Christ said, that he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit, and we have received the Holy Spirit. When did we, obviously all of us receive the Holy Spirit, but when did our creation appropriately receive the Holy Spirit? When Jesus was baptized. Uh, that was, that was the first time we actually saw the Trinity all together. Go ahead, Alani. God, God breathed into Adam? No, that's way before. That's, oh. that's, that's, that's Pentecost. Pretty, that's, that's human. Who, who just said it? Pentecost. Bravo, Nico. Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and all, all the followers. From there, the great proclamation went out. And that's when they did the commission, right? That's when they went out into the world and then went to the Jews, and to the Gentiles, and to the whole world. So that's actually technically the moment where the Holy Spirit then baptized all of us. That's why people have considered the Pentecost the beginning of the church, right? The beginning of, of our faith. But I take a pause there. The church, is, the church is God. It's the home of God. So it's ex actually existed since the beginning and till the end. It'll always exist. But the Holy Spirit, in that essence, remind the Holy Spirit is always present, right? But the actual baptism with the flaming tongues that went upon the apostles was Holy Pentecost for each and every one of us. So that's, that's something we need to remember that. And then understand that, you know, John, John baptizes with water, uh, but Christ and God baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we so symbolically remember and then honor this and understand it in this way. Because then, yes, through water, we imitate Christ's baptism for our children and for anyone that comes to the Orthodox faith to cleanse ourselves to follow the law, like the law had said, when they would wash themselves, even on the Day of Atonement, you're supposed to cleanse yourself physically, wash yourself, so you're, the, you're pure and clean, and so when you rise up, that we come out and that we are renewed, we are illumined, we are new, we are reborn, so to say. That's how born-again Christians come about in that existence. It's a sense of being reborn in that capacity. And so then from here, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. That's powerful because we use that even into our scriptures and into the hymnology of the church too, talking about St. John the Baptist. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley should be filled in. Every mountain and hill will made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough way is smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. And that was to say the, the, the ful fulfillment of everything that was to be done and that fulfillment comes in when john says behold the lamb of god who came into the world to save us sinners and he will point it out there it is there's your salvation everyone look go uh, you know what it reminds me of i love it um you know it's a very has anyone ever seen from the 60s the, the movie the long movie king of kings no yes i have i know my parents had i remember they had it uh that we had it on vhs and i remember it was very blurry because i think it was like on uh Channel 32, so like it's scra Scrabble, whatever the case would be. Anyways, uh, the one who played John really did an incredible job because he looked at not only the dishevelment, but obviously being in the wilderness, but even when he gazed upon Christ, when he was coming to the Jordan to be baptized, it made you feel moved just to see that, wow, you're coming to be baptized by me? I'm not even worthy to bend down and to unloosen your shoe, your lace, right? But he said this must be done and to show unto the world and everything else. And to me, those images and attitudes, that's why I want you when you're looking at this, just imagine it. 
or even when we look at the iconography of the baptism. If you look at the iconography of the baptism, I'm gonna actually put one up real quick, okay? And um, and when I do, oh, what did I put him in a thought? Of? There we go. And when I do, I want us to let's go. Okay. Uh, I want us to really, I want you to look at John's face. John, for instance, he is not looking right here. He's not actually looking at Christ. He's actually looking up. And the up is the awesomeness of God the Father, the Holy Spirit descending upon him as the dove, and Christ. And you guys ever wonder what these two images are in the water? These two images in the water, let's see if I can make a bigger picture, sorry. I see some people are trying to. Um, I forgot how to zoom in on my Mac. Anyways, the two images in the water represent the Jordan, and then in turn, the appropriateness, the beastliness that is of creation. In other words, the rivers have their tumultuousness, the volcanoes, the mountains, and everything else. That's why they're on beasts, right? Do you see that? And so it shows that yet when Christ was in the water, not only did the water of the river Jordan stop, it reversed. And that's something very powerful because if anyone has gone to Jerusalem and has actually gone to the river Jordan, if you go there on the epiphany where they celebrate it, at the moment when the patriarch goes and throws the cross of our Lord into the, the river Jordan, it pauses and actually turns its ways. And you actually see it almost looks like a little kiklo, a little cyclone right there by the cross. And you actually see the waters turn away from it, which is profound. That's physically and scientifically, that's an impossibility. But we know the truth. You know, everything that's impossible with man is possible with God. And we've seen that, and they have. There's videos, there's pictures and stuff, too. It's a moving, it's a moving, um, it's a moving scene that we can even participate in and uh, see that actually physically happen. So now we're talking about the, the part where, obviously, St. John is going to baptize Christ. So... John now says to the crowds, I'm going to ask um, Renee, can you, uh, can you read right here, verse 7, going down? Of course. Thank you. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Mm. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Wow. Axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, pause right there. That is so powerful. St. John, I want you guys to know, obviously, and then you will read later on about St. John, but we know St. John when we when we honor and celebrate and mourn his beheading in August 20 on, on August 29th it's a it's a strict fast day because it's obviously the beheading of the forerunner but the reason why he was beheaded we all know was because he spoke the truth and obviously we know Herodias did not like when he when he was telling her it is not lawful that you are to be with your dead husband's brother, right? And that you should not be consummating with him and stuff like that. And then obviously we know Salome dances and he says, I promise you whatever you want. And in her own anger, she wanted the head of the uh, John the Baptist on a silver platter. That's where then it, this, this is a, whatchamacallit, a prelude. Right here it says the ax already at the root of the trees and that every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. If you actually look at the icon of St. John the Baptist as well, too, there is an ax at the bottom of his icon with the tree to symbolize this. Because what this is reminding us, and it was, again, St. John telling the truth, he is very, he's very open to these broad of, brood of vipers. Think about that. Even, even Christ says the same thing later on. You brood of vipers. You, you whitewash tombs. I remember hearing that. We usually, we usually read that during um, Holy Week. And he's talking about the scribes and Pharisees. They're coming to see him here, these crowds. But he knows them. You were warned to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Metanoite again. Metania. 
and do not begin to yourselves, we have Abraham as our, as our father, because what we're witnessing now is the, the roots of the bad trees and the bad fruit are going to be cut, thrown into the fire, and cast away. And that is what he was trying to tell them, because they are the ones who are producing bad fruit. And what is the bad fruit they are producing? They are misleading. They are misguiding. They are misteaching. They are being inhumane. And they are not following in the works of our Lord to all the people. Because remember, all the people had the scribes and the Pharisees. They had the teachers and the leaders and all those stuff that were in the temple. Yet through every action, they were always given the sense of fear, right? That's why if you look at the, at the, the Judaic understanding of what was going on at this time, there, this was very bleak. When, they, when the shepherds saw Christ and their own innocence and being uneducated because they were shepherds, they saw the true Lord. When the Magi saw our Lord, they did not go back to Herod and tell him where he was. No, they went the other way. So then nothing would happen to the child. Then obviously an angel of the Lord obviously came and warned the mother and the father not to go. And obviously we know the rest of that story. But I mean, think of how powerful this was for John to speak the truth and everyone wanted to condemn him. Yet, yet, how about this one? Even though they were condemning him, they still liked him. Even the scribes and Pharisees, they would go behind his back and tell, you know, Herod, say, hey, you know, we got to do something about this guy. He's spreading some stuff. And what would they do? They would twist everything just like they would do with Christ and say that he is going to take power from you. He's going to take power from Caesar. And how no one should be taking power from Pontius Pilate, nor from Herod, or from Caesar. Do we see the Pechnidi? Do we see the games that are playing? And what's the sadness, my friends? Why am I even wasting the time of saying this? 2,000 years later, we're doing the exact same thing. We have the truth. We have the way. We have the love. And yet, no, I'm going to live the way I think I should live. You know, I'm okay with being prideful. I'm okay with being, you know, full of greed. Um, it's about me. I don't care about anyone else. Um, is that person suffering? That's a shame. You know what I mean? Do what you got to do. Are we, are we going over? Are we helping them? Are we ministering to them? Because even here, St. John's still ministering to them. Yeah, the truth hurts. Yet at the same time, he still baptizes them. And now we're going to continue because listen to this dialogue that he has with people. So, um, Renee, please continue. Okay. Um, right there, uh, we, Tan, what should we do? What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Mm. Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Mm. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. Continue. John answered them all, yeah. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with Many other words, John ex exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Very good, very good. So we're going to start back here with 10 and go into 14. What should we do then, the crowd asked, okay? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Okay. What we're about to read here is the exact same thing that our Lord tells us not only and how we are supposed to be with everyone, but the same thing that he said this past Sunday in chapter 6. Sinners even love each other. So... What good is it to you to love those who only love you? Go out and help those. Do unto others as you'd have done unto yourself. That golden rule. 
That's not Buddhism. That's not karma. That's not any attitude. That's Christ. That's love. That's us. And that's what it's expressed to us. And right here, St. John was expressing it even, not to say before Christ, but for the preparation of Christ. And then I tell everyone, what were the prophets saying before St. John the Baptist? They were expressing the truth. People did not want the truth. My favorite story is we, we are creating Towers of Babel. Do you ever want to remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Oh, yes, it's so fun. Yes, we'll go all the way up. We're going to go past the sky and everything, and we'll show everything. And let's build, and let's build, and it gets all the way to the top. And then everyone in their pride and the glory, and it all crumbles and crashes down. And I always tell people, we create that in our own. I, I know Tower of Babel. You're a Tower of Babel. The world and everything in it is a Tower of Babel. Because why? We have pride. We have ego and greed. And that's all we care about. I mean, you have two shirts. Give one away. What do you need the two shirts for? Go wash the other one and go take care of it. But we, we metaphorically create Towers of Babel because why? We enjoy being little, physically, I'm saying, on top of the other person, right? I want you to be lower than me. And we now see that, forget about um, uh, monetarily, we have a class system, poor, middle, and, and uh, upper class. We do that, think about it with uh, uh, racially, okay? And I, I say this appropriately, and it's not to bring any argumentation where the case may be. Um, blacks and whites. Blacks, from the understanding of what we have seen and we've read through history, because of how we, when we went into them, or anyone that was not considered Caucasian, I'm minding that's from our standpoint, was inferior or an abnormality. If someone has blue eyes and doesn't have brown, there must be abnormal. If someone had brown hair or blonde hair or not, you know, token color or whatever, they must be abnormal. The best part I tell everyone is, the other person who is abnormal probably thinks you're abnormal. And so I tell people, I'm like, why, why do we have these, these definitions of these attitudes? Because what ended up coming from this? Slavery, abomination, inhumanity, uh, racism, death, everything else. And we're talking about from the time of Adam and Eve, from their sons, when jealousy uh, forced them to, obviously from Cain to kill, to kill his brother. Cain killed his brother? Abel. Yeah, Abel died. Cain killed Abel. And then obviously we know about Seth afterwards. But from that moment, why? Where, where is envy needed? Why is it even in this context where we can't even be humane? And I was just talking with our, uh, our wonderful Sunday school earlier, and I, they were talking about this project they're going to do, you know, the natural uh, gathering supplies and their um, gently used clothes and gently used coats. I said, I think now more so than ever, we need to rise above and give as best as we can. So in other words, if people are insecure or not comfortable to give, drop it off. I, I don't, you don't have to be here. Don't put it together. We'll figure it out. But our world needs love and we need a hand more so now than ever. If it means I'm wearing a mask and I'm gonna give you my hand, fine. But this is what our world needs because my friends, this is a darkened, this is a darkened state. But as I say to everyone, even though there's darkness, everything has two sides. There's so much light. There's so much beauty to it. Again, I've said it openly, since March, I've been looking through silver linings. I look at our own community, I look at our people and I've seen efforts. There is so much beauty. There is so much joy that I personally just say in my own mind, I don't even tune in to understanding of the rhetoric or anything that's going on negatively in the world. I'm not oblivious to it, but I don't put a, I don't put a notion to it because I know I must rise above. And it's not because I'm a priest. It's because I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a human, and I'm trying to just be a better example. The last thing that I want to do is fall into a negative state where I can't express what it means, what St. John says here, when the crowd asks. This wasn't them breaking up. It says, what the crowd asks. He simply says, if you have two shirts, go give one away. And anyone who, who has food should do the exact same. Uh, that's kind of foreign to us. Why? They were in Babylon. They were in captivity. They didn't have anything at all. They were slavery. And now they're get, gaining stuff. Well, I don't want to give it away. Why do you want me to give it away? Now that I've actually set some stuff and I have foundations, you're going to ask me to start giving stuff away? Oh, I don't know, right? There's a lot of question in their heart. So I go back to what we were saying earlier. Why do we have questions? Or one crisis, why, why, does, why, is, why are there questions rising in your heart? And that's very powerful. doesn't ask about our mind. 
He doesn't ask about our soul. He asks about their heart. Why are there questions in your heart? Or the Greek term that I love is when he calls us and he says, sklerokardia. Why is there harden of your heart? In other words, if your heart has love or you see you're human, shouldn't you just be doing this stuff naturally? Hmm? And that's the question we should be asking ourselves. And John too, but John's telling you just the truth. What I, you want me to tell you what I think John is here? John, as we know, is the greatest of men born, and we hear Christ say that later. But John is just simply what we would compare him to in this world. And I say this appropriately. Please forgive me. I'm not trying to create St. John in this manner. He's a comedian who keeps it real. In other words, he tells it like it is, and people don't want to hear it. And I laugh about it because it's comical, but it's the truth. Look at him. He's telling it to each one. We heard this. Now, even tax collectors came to be baptized. Tax collectors were the scum. I'm saying the scum. No one liked them. You are taking from what is mine. You are giving it to the kratos. You are giving it to the people. You're giving it to the governor. They're under occupation of the Romans. I don't like you. you you're one of us, but you're betraying us because you're taking it from us. You see this attitude? You see what I'm saying? Okay. And he says, teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more that's required of you, he told them. Pause right there. Do not take any more that is required of you. The question I ask everyone, and I always bring this up, is, so what's required of you? And, the, and then the answer is, well, I don't know. It's infinite, right? All of us. I've always talked with anyone who has greed or always has this attitude. I need more, more, more. So I ask them, so when are you done? When does it stop? Hmm? And there's no answer. And I say this appropriately because greed, greed is an addiction. If someone has an addiction to narcotics or drinking or smoking or whatever the case may be, I ask them, and when's enough? Or when do you find stop? When you obviously get drunk or, God forbid, you OD or something else? When's enough? Because it's that harsh reality. And because we make reality harsh. So I try to tell people, so how do we change this? How do we make it into a better world? And it's very heavy. These are heavy stuff. And then here, so we heard about the tax collectors. Do not collect more than is required of you. We hear about this in Zacchaeus. What does Zacchaeus does? He gives fourfold back, right? So whatever he took from them, he gave fourfold back. That's the example of repentance, Metania. He knew, I knew I did wrong. My turn to help and give back. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? I find the soldiers, and when I read from the church fathers, very powerful. Why would Roman soldiers go see this John, this random crazy man in this wilderness? And I think what is, what is important for us to realize is that our Lord tells us that he has not seen greater faith than compared to the centurion who asked for his own servant to be healed in all of Jerusalem, in all of Judea. Do you remember when he said that, our Lord said that? Again, even though they were Gentiles, they were not even believers. Who knows what they were, whatever the case may be. There's something about these soldiers, these people who are dedicated, followers, servants, and workers, that when he, they even ask this question. Because I always tell people, and I, again, it goes back to my earlier statement, why do we ask questions? Hmm? Or, or how about this one that I wanted to also point out too when we're talking about uh, what I've been witnessing with our Orthodox Christian faith. What do you think I as a priest see with most people? I would like to ask you guys a simple, let's put a simple poll question. What percentage do you think people actually have the wherewithal to want to ask me questions about their faith? What do you think is the percentage? So just give me some numbers. I want to hear from you guys. Anyone, go ahead. 5%. Uh, who said? 5%. I say 30. Renee says 30. Ten. Anyone else? Alex? 10. Anyone else? 20. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, let's just pause there. Because correct, correctly, you're on the right generality. It is very, very low. There, we are so timid. We are so scared but i won't say scared you know what people feel and i know this because i try to be open with all of you i actually feel sad because i think people are embarrassed that we really don't know our faith and that's what i was trying to get back from the beginning of um from the back of like with everything going on with with, with our faith and with uh covid people are like asking questions or you know and forget about communion that's another different topic but other stuff as well too and they're they, they're ashamed they don't want to ask questions and i always tell people why? I, I'm growing. I don't know everything. 
I can't tell you how many times I read the scripture, even with these groups, that I learn something new every single time. I mean, it's, it's so profound how the wisdom of God does this to us. I, I, I learn too. Whenever I give a sermon, I have to study to tell you guys what I'm trying to express. If not, I'll sound like a blabbering idiot that, you know, I do most of the other time. Do you know what I mean? So without putting that effort, I won't know. So what, what, what hurts us to like the soldiers here where they could have been ashamed to ask a question to the great John the Baptist, yet they persevered and said, and what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Wow. Be content with your pay. We're in a world now, more so than even Peter's time. So, Linus, I'm talking about your vivid attitude from the younger ages, and any one of us, where you got a nice job or you wanted to grow in a company, you would stay and build. I know so many friends and family, five years, I'm going something better, four years, something else, I'm going to something else. I don't have time for this. I, I got to make more money. I got to move on. I understand that we're in a different climate as well, too. But that attitude, be content with your pay. I think of the be, be content with your pay is a reminder for us to be content with the blessings that we have. Pay is something we give, get, receive from our works. But we have been given so many blessings in our lives that we're so blind to what it happens in front of us. Health, family, work, education, a good set of hair, a mind. You know what I mean? Whatever the case may be. We all have it, yet we don't. We take it for granted. That's just the bottom line. That's us. Because why? We are inundated from our society and our world. It's not from our parents. It's not from our grandparents. Because I look back at our grandparents and parents, and what do they always do? They strive to have better lives. But even though they strive to have better lives, they lived it. They put effort and perseverance. And you know what's the best part? And I think Peter, Deacon Zachariah, and anyone else that's a little bit older can look back and say. I have a good life. I'm thankful, for my, I'm thankful for my life. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my household and everything else. And when you can think that, we're young and immature, 33. People could call us punks, you know, jokes, whatever the case may be. We're immature. But the older that you get, you were supposed to get wiser. Yet, and, and, and Sophia and wisdom that we're supposed to have, it takes even longer and longer. So that's why... I, I tell people is that when we look at St. John here, where it says, be content with your pay, I think we should be understanding that we should also be content with our blessings because we are receiving so many of them that we should just, in every single day of our lives, should just be giving glory to God. Everything. Glory to God. Thank you, God. You know, doxology, everything to our Lord, because he is the one who bestows all of his blessings upon us. And then here, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wanting in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And, you know, this is just standard because ever since all the prophets beforehand, what did they all want? They wanted a triumphant Messiah. They wanted a Savior. They wanted a Litroti, someone to come in and save them from the bondage of the, uh, of the uh, Romans and then naturally any oppressors and give them, you know, the new temple, the, 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 the new Jerusalem, the glory that's in, uh, on Zion and everything else that we say. And yet, no, because John answers them. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of those sandals who I am not, un, who I am not worthy to untie. Humility. That's defined right there. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. That fire is such a strong metaphorical word that people can't comprehend. It's the same fire that came down from God when the, uh, when the Jews were escaping from the Egyptians and the, the, the force of Herod. I'm sorry, the force of the of Pharaoh. Any capacity, whenever the fire has been an expression. The burning bush, that was fire there expressing to see who God was. And, and if you actually look, you actually look, I find this to be so powerful. Have you, has anyone actually ever seen an icon of the uh, burning bush? The icon of the burning bush, I'm going to look it up real quick, one second. The icon of the burning bush symbolizes Moses taking off his sandals because he knows that this is holy land. And in the burning bush, there is a very powerful representation. Can anyone tell me what is represented in the burning bush? Before I put it up, someone want to tell me? Sin. Who? Sin. 
I'm 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 not from I'm taking a guess. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I probably didn't hear it correctly. Oh, I'll I'll type it. Okay. No, don't worry about it. I already found it. That's not clear. Um, Teddy, I'm gonna... mm. Who's there? Does everyone see it? Is it the Virgin Mary? Yep. It's the Virgin Mary holding Christ. Yep. Because the one that the word of God that was incarnate came to speak and then take the form of man, which we see in the essence that was represented in the burning bush. Because remember, Moses couldn't look into it. He couldn't look up. Remember, even the fire of the burning bush, it was very powerful. And who was the one who contained the uncontainable? The Virgin Mary. Bravo. That's powerful. Do you hear what I just said? You ever want to hear something powerful? Come to church on, on the Fridays during Great Lent at the Salutations. And when you hear the breakdown of that poetry, of the Salutations, the one who contained the uncontainable, mm -hmm. the one who gave birth to the one who created the stars. Y platitera tonura non. More spacious than the heavens. These are terms that are not humanistic. We can't comprehend. I can't. I, I get chills when I hear about this just to contemplate how incredible the will of God is and the obedience and love of the Theotokos to allow that to happen. Think about that. That's so strong and powerful that she is the one who was able to do this and to understand that even in the biblical times, we can understand this metaphors and how that the church fathers were able to connect them and, and historians and everyone that would put this into scriptures gave so much power to these powerful words. And then from there, his winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, right? Okay, just like anyone, when it's time for the harvest, it's time to reap. We got to clean and go from there. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That means obviously the thing that needs to be burned that is not acceptable at that time goes into that fire. Us, when we're not acceptable, when we're not humane, when we're not merciful, loving, compassionate, empathetic, and everything else, that's, that's hell. When everyone asks me what's hell, what's, what's being in hell, it's, separated from, it's separation from God. Mm -hmm. When we look at the example of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, when Lazarus then goes up to the bosom of Abraham, that we talk about us when anyone, someone dies, and we say, may this person go into the bosom of Abraham. And then in turn, the rich man goes into Hades and asks Lazarus to dip his finger into his tongue just to, just to give it some sort of solace and some sort of comfort. They said, well, when Lazarus was hungry and had the sores, did you help him? Did you minister to him? Did you serve him? Did you love him? Did you bring him into your home and take care of him? No. You watched him to die and then turn get licked by, the dog, by a dog on his sores. And, but he says, then send someone from the... From, uh, from the dead, and they will listen to them. They have the prophets. They have those who learn, right? That's the whole parable of the story. But again, that unquenchable fire, that Hades, that, that, that fire, that brimstone, that separation, it is truly defined as us being separated from God. When we're separated from God, now we are in a sense of darkness, are we not? We don't have the light. We don't have the joy. We don't have the celebration. And then in turn, we create ourselves as our own types of God. And so in turn, what's the necessity to be united with God? when I don't know who God is or what do I want to do with God. And then in turn, when we get into that darkness, into that state, the powerfulness of this, I tell people, is even sinners, all of us are sinners. If someone dies, we pray for them. doesn't matter who it is. Have you ever thought about prison ministry? Many people don't. We all think we incarcerate people. We throw them in there and like lock up the key and say, God bless you, good luck. You know how intense it is to do a prison ministry to someone who is repenting of what they've done? And that burden of the sin of the action, whatever it did, it could have been from something as silly as stealing something to as severe as taking a life, yet they're incarcerated. Has anyone thought about how strong that is and how in turn we're supposed to pray for them? And we're also supposed to be merciful. That's the hard part. That's tough. That's tough. Because it could have been an own family. And whenever I hear like a family on the TV or on the radio and say, you know, they killed their child or whatever, and they say, I forgive them, man. I don't know. They're better than I am. And not to say I won't, but that's tough. That's tough. And they might just state, and you know the other thing as well too, they might just state it, but their heart will be heavy. 
And if that's the case, then they are truly the greatest of the examples of Christianity, of, our, of the human, because it's heavy. Those are heavy stuff. And when we can't contemplate them, but remember that they're still incarcerated, and they're still humans, you got to minister. You have to minister to them. That's why even prison ministry, you know, it's, an, it's not only it's an existence, but it's something very powerful. And where if we don't think about that, then, then what's the point of humanity? If someone does something wrong, you just lock them away and you don't try to help or at least try to pray for them. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier when we had to begin our conversation with Renee and everyone else, you know, regarding with like Trump. You know, they all wish him ill. They all wish that he dies, right? That he got COVID and kalanapathy and good karma. Come on, guys. That's not right. We say it's not right. We might, some people might believe it, but who gains? Are you, do you gain something because you were able to state that? Or you're going to gain likes on a social media page? Or, share, or people will share your status? Come on. That's not human. I don't wish ill on anyone. Yeah, I'll get frustrated. Yeah, I disagree. But why, what, do you, what do we gain by wishing ill? Nothing. Nothing. We gain that that person suffers. And what do we do? Do we get better? No, of course not. We, we cover our suffering with other people's suffering. And we, take, we, we blanket our suffering and we want people to suffer with us. You ever think about most addicts? What do addicts like to do? They don't like to be alone. They like to find other addicts that suffer as well too. So it could be a co cohabitation. Drink together, right? Uh, do narcotics together, whatever the case would be. When you gamble, if you find people to gamble with and you enjoy, okay, you're going to have shame. And if they don't do the same thing as you do, right? But it shows. It shows how, how difficult it could be and how we all stick together if we want to stick together, yet we don't pray and love those who hate us or don't agree with us. That's the bigger picture in everything we're doing. But when John, uh, but then with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. And what's the good news, my friends? The good news is that our Lord is, is present, that he is here, and he has come to save us and the whole world. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, as I said, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done. Uh, guys, don't forget, everyone points out that what Herod did with his, with, uh, with his new wife, with Herodias, his brother's wife, uh, he did slaughter the 10,000 innocents more. How many? 14,000? You know what that is? Do you know what's the slaughter a one-year-old and under of a population then of 14,000? I mean, how was there not an uprising then to go kill them? I mean, mothers, fathers. And just imagine that fascism and control that he did that with so much anger just because a baby was born that he thought was going to take his pride, take his, take his kingship, take his rule, everything in world, because it was all metaphorical in his attitude. How sad, how destructive, how painful. Can't imagine. That's why if you ever hear the story of those uh, innocents that were slaughtered, um, they relate it back to, I think Matthew does it, Matthew relates it back to Rachel when she was weeping and lamenting because her children were no more. Just like any other mother. I can't, I can't imagine that. Anytime I see an elderly mother and, a, and her child dies, and the child could have been 50, 60, 70 years old, that's heartbreaking. And then you hear them say, why did it take me? Why did they do that to me? That is very powerful. And that's why, you know, the, the attitude with Herod, with whatever he did. And then it says, Herod added this to all of them. And he locked John up in prison, okay? So then we know more into the story of that. And then right here, we're going to read the baptism and genealogy of Jesus. I'm going to leave this for next week when we go into this part uh, for chapter 3. And then um, verse 21, and then we'll go more forward from there. So I do want to uh, thank all of you for being on tonight. Uh, this was really a uh, captivating night. Um, I do want it to be more open like this. I really respect all of you and your, your opinion. So God bless you for doing that. And um, again, I'm going to be very honest. And this is most important. Don't be shy. Uh, don't be bashful. Uh, and, and I express to all of you, and I say this to anyone, please do not ever feel embarrassed. I ask questions. I try to learn more. And again, I'm going to be honest. I know it sounds kind of comical, but you saw what I did. Go on Google. Go on to GoArch. Go on to different things and try to understand our Orthodox faith a little bit more because that is how we are going to grow and unite ourselves with God and with each other. Everything we've been taught as kids and our parents and our faith have been great. 
doesn't stop there. Go add, mature, cultivate, and pile on top of whatever you've learned so that when you have your families, when you have anyone around you, and I don't want you to go out and grab a Bible and say, hey, do you want to learn about Jesus Christ? No. I want you through your own actions and your own love express to who Jesus Christ is by being a true human being. So I pray each and every one of you have a great night. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to upload this uh, video uh, probably tomorrow onto our YouTube channel, and we'll probably send it out to our community. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again next week as well, too. God bless you guys. Have a great night. You too. Father, right. happy, you well, happy Father. anniversary, Father. Thank you, thank you Nick. Thank I appreciate you. it. Yeah, yesterday we celebrated seven years, but it's Bethesda and I, so – so far, so good. She's still, she's still with me, so she hasn't left, so I'll take it. <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.